I'm Brian Levine, and welcome to The Gould Standard, a podcast brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation. We're just now celebrating our 40th anniversary year, and we're here once again bringing you conversations with some of the most remarkable people from all across the world of the arts. If music, film, theater, painting, poetry, and photography are the spice to your life, come on in, you're among friends. But first, while you're stopping by under our incandescently inviting neon piano sign, please do take a moment to press like, share, and subscribe, kindly leave your comments, pose your questions, and be part of our community of friends and supporters. We'll also invite you to pay us a visit at our website, glengool.ca, and when you're there, if you find yourself in the grip of an irresistible impulse to click the donate button, well, we'd be proud and honored to have you as a supporter. We are a registered Canadian charity and rely on the support of friends like you. Today, we're very fortunate to have with us an artist who has really brought a huge new energy and excitement to the classical piano repertoire. In a few short years, Vikingur Olafsson has joined the ranks of the finest pianists of our time with best-selling recordings, legions of fans, and a concert career that spans the globe. A native of Iceland and born on Valentine's Day, Mr. Olafsson will be turning 40 in just a few days, and he is at the height of his powers artistically and in career terms. His record label, Deutsche Grammophon, tells us that his recordings have been streamed over 600 million times. Not bad for those who think that classical music doesn't have a vibrant audience. He collaborates with many of the great composers of our time, including Philip Glass, John Adams, Thomas Addis, and has a particular affinity for the Hungarian composer Georg Kirtag. He is renowned for the brilliance, clarity, and technique of his playing, and also the beauty of his sound, and the thoughtful and unexpected programming that goes into the, his recordings. Now, he really does take the concept of the classical music album in exciting and sometimes daring new directions, like, for example, pairing Ramo with Debussy, Mozart with the music of lesser-known composers of his time, and uh, encouraging other artists to do their own remixes of his performances. He has been called Iceland's Glenn Gould, but I hate those kinds of comparisons. We might just as well say that Glenn Gould was Canada's Vikingur Olafsson. In so many ways, they are entirely different musical personalities, but there are some intriguing parallels, which I'm looking forward to exploring. And one of them comes with his newest recording, Bach's Eternally Fresh Revelatory Goldberg Variations. Vikingur, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, uh, it's our pleasure. Now, you have called the Goldberg Variations history's greatest keyboard work, and you're performing it this year 88 times, one for, I guess, each key on a standard piano. Yeah. Not a Bosendorf or Imperial, but a standard <laughs> piano. Uh, why? Well, it's actually turning into something a bit more than my nicely conceptual member of 88 because of some repeat concerts, but I wanted to have a, a year off, so to say. I mean, like a, like a workaholic's year off, my year with one piece of music, my favorite piece of music, the Goldberg Variations. You know, traveling the globe, taking a break from the industry as such, not going to all the well, wonderful orchestras, conductors, uh, all the sort of variety of my normal season, and just having a sort of singularly focused year with this piece. And my goal with this is to see how many variations in terms of, you know, interpretation and performance uh, I can come up with you know, hopefully in a very natural way throughout this season. Um, and these variations seem to me so infinite in terms of possibilities of interpreting them. So I just wanted to see what would actually happen if I had this kind of focus on a single piece of music. When you call it the greatest keyboard work of all time, that really is interesting because Bach in his time didn't have a modern piano and his music isn't composed with a particular set of instrumental colors in mind. He didn't have the tonal resources of a Steinway D, um, and he didn't write music specifically in a way to exploit the tonal and expressive resources of the instrument, like Schumann, Brahms, and especially Liszt and Chopin did. So how do you justify calling it the greatest keyboard one? <laughs> Well, because it is, <laughs> and I don't think I have, <laughs> I don't think I have to justify it too much. But you know, the word hybrid is very much in fashion these days. People use the word hybrid for almost everything, uh, and I think the piano can be seen as a uh, the modern piano as a kind of a hybrid instrument, something that sort of bridges 
the possibilities of the organ, the harpsichord, and perhaps, you know, in a certain sense, uh, the, the bigger ensemble, you know, you can, w w with all the possibilities, you know, of, of, of the, of the palette, of the dynamics, of the, of the range of texture and touch that you have with the modern piano, it, it seems to me to combine so many different worlds that Bach had to sort of, you know, separate a little bit in his, in his works. I mean, I have no doubt that if he were to be presented here today with the modern piano, I mean, he would just be like a kid in a candy store. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, so, and, but this is a good point that you raise, and it is quite interesting to think of the Goldberg variations, not through the lens of 2024. So not looking back because, you know, almost everybody has been inspired by this work. You see the late sonatas of Beethoven, uh, take so much from the Goldberg variations. Um, Schumann, Brahms, you know, all of them, you know, so many of the sort of compositional thoughts and the, uh, the instrumental techniques sort of being invented by Bach or really developed in this piece play such a prominent role in the 19th and 20th and 21st centuries. And today it is very hard to think that when Bach wrote this piece in 1741, he certainly did not know the late sonatas of Beethoven and <laughs> he did not know no Sch Sch Schumann's writing. Um, so, so in that sense, it is very interesting to try to imagine the world of 1741 and only have what's sort of come before and then imagine you being in the sort of situation of Bach and, and writing this and it becomes even more of a masterpiece if you think about it in these terms, you know, if you erase everything that came after it and just think that he had, he had to invent this so much from scratch, you know, and of course not from scratch because he seems to be also, also sort of like cataloging all the existing keyboard techniques and approaches and, you know, structures of keyboard writing. It's almost like an encyclopedia of how you can think about the keyboard in the Baroque era, uh, but also an encyclopedia, how you can simply dream on the keyboard and, and, and sort of fantasize in music. Um, yeah, so it is, it's, it's a good question. How do we approach the Goldberg variations? I think, you know, we are here in the year 2024 and we have everything that preceded us now and we're not stuck in 1741. So it is very difficult to, to not take a little bit of late Beethoven into your approach to the Goldberg variations today. And you, you know, in terms of your approach, I, uh, I read a, a very interesting interview uh, that you gave, I think it was the New York Times, um, about your, your approach, which you know, uh, often artists approach the, a work of this complexity and structural rigor, which it certainly is, with a, a somewhat formalistic approach, but you've taken what I would describe more of uh, a narrative approach. You've kind of looked at the work as a, a cycle that in, expresses the arc of human life from sort of fresh, innocent beginnings to the first, you know, explorations energetically of, you know, sort of childhood to the first experiences of loss and tragedy and a kind of a summing up about, you know, sort of the joys of domesticity and family with a, a kind of a rustic flavor in the quote Levet, and then finally uh, acceptance and departure. It kind of catches a sense of the unending cycle of life by recapitulating the opening aria with the, the end being the beginning. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the variations particularly that contributed to that view of the piece? Yeah, sure. And I change my mind about this all the time. I said this to the New York Times in October last year in 23. <laughs> and now I, I tend to think more of the Goldberg variations like a solar system, like the Aria as a kind of a sun and, and the 30 different planets that surround it. Uh, so you can also have that approach where you don't try to connect them too much into one sort of narrative of, of, of a life cycle or something. Of, of, but if we take that, if we take that path, uh, thinking of it in terms of a, of a human life cycle, it's, it is quite easy to read this piece, uh, the aria being the ode to life, the birth of something magnificent, you know, simple and yet profound. And then you have the first 14 variations, all of them in G major, nothing really, if, if we imagine we were hearing this piece for the very first time and it was the world premiere in 1741, when we are on variation 13 or, you know, the daydreaming one or the variation 14, it's brilliant uh, rhetoric variation. Uh, full of joy, exuberance, there's nothing really to prepare you for variation 15, which turns light into shadow. Uh, you go from G major to G minor, first of uh, three such instances in this work. And it is quite easy to read this piece as an exploration of the world in the first 14 variations, where you are sort of, you know, taking in the different facets of, of existence. Uh, it's like a happy childhood. Uh, at least you can sort of naively 
put it in those fantasy terms. Um, Variation 15, I think Glenn Gould called it something like the perfect music for uh, Good Friday. I, I think he said something along those lines, and, and I, I kind of agree with him. It's a, it's a desolate, it's desperate, it's a, it's a, it's as introvert as you know. The opening has more or less been extrovert. Um, it is really the great contrast, and it can easily be read like that moment in our lives that we encounter the first great loss on a personal human level. Um, but I think the fundamental message of the Goldberg Variations is a bit of a Mozartian one. It's uh, it's uh, it's sort of fundamentally an optimistic piece of music. We have to bounce back and find our our path to to happiness and and sort of way of enjoying existence. And I think he does that so beautifully by halfway through the piece, coming to the French Overture Variation Sixteen, which restarts and really begins the second second act of the Goldberg Variations. It certainly is a piece in two acts, almost like a like an oratorio for keyboard, you could say, you know. And then, you know, we bounce back and we have these very lighthearted variations, actually, 16, 17, 18, 19, some of the least serious pieces in, in and my favorite canon of all of them, uh, the canon on the sixth, the, you know, perfectly imitative canon that is perhaps the most Mozartian thing that Bach ever wrote. <laughs> um, but then, you know, and, and variation 20, of course, brilliant and virtuosic. But then you have variation 21, which is a very different kind of drama and tragedy in G minor, again, more declamatory to me, um, more like, you know, feeling the strength through the tragedy rather than sort of surrendering yourself to the to the trauma of the tragedy. Uh, you know, we come back and I think the most significant moment in the piece for almost everybody who plays it has to be variation 25, which also, yeah, you know, turns the sure. piece upside down in terms of structure. Can you imagine again, the world premiere of this work, which I don't even know when it took place. If it really took place in Bach's time, did they actually play this piece in its entirety as a public performance or live performance, you know, for Count Kaiserlink? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but imagine you're hearing this piece and you had these variations and you have had 24 of them and they're all more or less two, three minute long. And then all of a sudden variation 25 comes with all of its chromaticism and, and despair. And it happens to be eight or nine or however many minutes it takes long. And uh, it again, it's a little bit like that moment in variation 15 when you encounter G minor for the first time. And then when you encounter this expansion of time and space in variation 25, on top of the sort of pushing the idea of harmonic language that we knew in 1741 to the absolute brink of what is possible. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still enigma to me, even if I've now played this piece about 50 times <laughs> in concert in the, in the last, in the last, I don't know, four months, but it, but it, it, it still sort of grabs you by the throat, but you come back and you again have to find, you have to find strength and you have to find the will to live after those setbacks. Uh, and it's just like in life, you know, and then Bach manages to finish the piece in sort of a spectacular way with this, you know, flourish of variations that just sort of, it's just like an engine that is, all, it's, I almost right, think right, of it right, like, right. like, like an aircraft that is just sort of like starting and, 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 and going faster and faster and faster before you take off. That's the feeling of the ending of the Goldberg variation. So when he's really, again, come to the brink of expression at the end of variation 29, where can you go? He has to find a way of ending this piece, and he goes to the Code Libat, which is a way of coming home, bringing your hero home in the epic, you know, uh, coming home to your known grounds, bringing in sort of pop melodies of his day, 1741, bringing in two famous uh, folk tunes into this kind of medley, this mu musical mismatch, uh, before the RA returns. But I think it's a very symbolic gesture, you know, you, you come home to a Kodlibet, which was a family gathering where the Bach family would basically get together and improvise counterpoint together. You come home to your family. That's the only way to conclude an epic like this, a journey of, of this scope. And I think it's a symbolic moment. And to me, it's a little bit like, you know, alle Menschen werden Brüder, this kind of, all, you know, yes. we all, all people will become, you know, we'll find brotherhood for all people like Beethoven's message in, in the last moment of the Ninth Symphony before the aria comes back and you really feel when you play it that you've sort of gone through a whole whole life and you when you have the aria at the end it's it's the most um beautiful uh way of expressing what classical music is you know you know it, it repeats itself but it doesn't repeat itself you can't repeat yourself 
and the music is the same, but it's not the same. And we are the same, but we aren't, you know, and, and, uh, and you hear it then as, as, uh, as you can imagine in your old age, at the end of your life, you look back and, and you sort of hear glimpses of your past experiences, ups and downs through these, these, uh, you know, eternal melodies of the area. That's a, a beautiful explanation. It, it strikes so many resonant chords with me. Um, you know, for me, for example, Variation 25 is one of the most powerful expressions of tragedy and despair. I, I think in Bach, you don't find anything like it except possibly in the passions. And um, and you you really underscore the essential humaneness. I mean, Bach, you know, for much of his sort of uh, post-mortem history until he began to be rediscovered um, in and re-evaluated in the 20th century, was seen as an austere, sometimes as a rather academic, a rather form formalistic composer, you know, kind of like a, a chess player, you know, cool, but but not very uh, but not very emotionally deep. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. And, and presenting this work, which is, again, a structural architectural masterpiece in such human terms, it, it actually reminds me, I had the, the I don't know whether privilege is the right word, but I attended Glenn Gould's memorial service along with about 3,000 other people in Toronto. And the second recording of the Goldberg Variations had just been released. It actually wasn't available in Canada yet. It was it was uh, released in New York a little before, and um, there was a big service with a lot of you know sort of famous Canadian musicians performing and and speaking and and so on. And the end of the service was a an ethereal sounding uh, perform. Uh, playing uh, over loudspeakers of the aria da capo. And I can tell you that um, it's hard to describe the level of emotion, uh, but uh, you know, people in their 70s and 80s were crying like babies. And uh, you know, it, it's very odd to describe something that comes from the life of a musician in these terms, but it made me think about you know, the, the, the death of John Kennedy, you know, that level of intense emotion. And only the Goldberg Variations could have, I think, created that that response. Yeah. I mean, not just the occasion, but yeah, it almost brings a tear to my eye just just thinking about this, and also thinking about how young he was when he died and how short his life yep. was. Uh, he it should was. He, he should really be alive today. You know, he would be in his early nineties. Uh, he would be he would be the same age as your as one of your teachers at Juilliard, uh, Jerome Lowenthal. That's right. He That's was right. also born in 1932. And Jerry is coming to my Carnegie Hall concert in two weeks uh, where I'm playing the Goldberg Variations, and he's as live as, as one can be alive. So right. So there we are. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, it, it is what it is. He certainly left a very rich discography. Just coming back to the Goldbergs, um, you know, it was written, we think, around 1741, so... Uh, Bach would have been 55, 56 years old. That was already well past the average life expectancy in, in Europe. Um, so he might well have been in a position to reflect on the arc of his own life. He certainly knew death, his first wife, you know, many of his children. Um, and there could be a kind of a self-referential. I, I don't think, I think it's pushing the the analogy a little too much to say a, a kind of a uh, you know, pre Straussian Ein Heldenleben, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, you, you never know. Um, anyway, the uh, and and also the um, the quote Lebet, which which really is kind of a summation that brings you back, you know, the uh, to a, a kind of a you know joy and domesticity, the family that will carry on after when you're no longer there. Mm -hmm. You know, which again sort of hints at that that return. Uh, that kind of eternal um, uh, continuation, um, and the last thing is the your reference to to Mozart in in connection with the Goldbergs, which I find really fascinating because it does remind me, particularly some of the humorous pieces of the sort of version of Mozart that we we find in Hermann Hesse's novel Steppenwolf, the kind of you know teaching one to embrace both the tragedy of life and still yet understand a kind of eternal laughter uh, and humor. Yeah. It's all there. 
Well, I think, I mean, coming back to, to where Bach was in 1741, having lost his first wife and about 10 of his 20 children, um, I think uh, this piece is a testament. You know, it is one of the four pieces that he chose to publish during his lifetime, Klavier Pungen, you know, these four books, because he was completely unpublished and, of course, so much less famous than people like Handel and actually quite a few others during his time. He was barely known. Um, and he, here he is, you know, history's greatest musician, I think uh, it's fair to say, and perhaps artist. He, he, there he is in Leipzig. You know, he was the third choice for the job in Leipzig. It's all just <laughs> right. sort of hard to comprehend. And he chooses this piece. He writes this piece. I think it's a testament. It's it's like Beethoven writing the last three sonatas. It's it's a testament. You know, he wants to. He wants. It's it's a legacy that he is sort of getting across here, uh, and it is like an encyclopedia of again how you can think on the on the keyboard and dream. But I think there's you know the fact that he chose this piece and not something that would be much more accessible to the more general public. He's not trying to become famous. He wants this to be on the record for posterity. But what is posterity to him? He had probably very low hopes that anyone would ever be playing this piece because in 1741, it's easy to forget today while we are, you know, very busy playing two and three hundred year old music, uh, that people barely played music that was older than five years old or even three years old. And preferably they played something written this year or last. And um, so, and, and, and the idea of the classical concert was, I mean, so far away from being even born. How, how I sometimes think, how did it feel to him to to write something, you know, of this sort of magnitude uh, and stature, and and basically have no audience for something like this, for a creation like this? I think Forkel writes in the first biography of Bach, where is it, eighteen oh one or something? I think he writes something that that uh, to the line along the lines that you know, one who could actually play a variation or two from the Goldberg variations could could easily make a fortune. Because, I mean, they are quite difficult, let's face it. And they were quite above, you know, I, I believe that the, the general sort of skill of, of people, you know, the amateurs of the time. And I think the fact that he chooses to publish this uh, is almost like a letter to the future that you put in a bottle and you float on the northern Atlantic Ocean or something like that. And, and then you just see what happens to it. And thankfully, it's found its way, you know, more than anything through, through Glenn Gould. And, and to us today, we have a lot to, to be grateful to Gould for, and uh, but nothing more than this bringing this piece into into the active performing repertoire like he did, and you know making us realize you know history's great greatest keyboard work is well this piece. But I, I keep thinking about this, you know, how did it feel to 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 not have an audience and create something of this you know of this size? I, I it's right. hard to it, comprehend. Exactly, and and along the same line, his actual final work, his valedictory work, Art of Fugue which literally couldn't have been performed or composed with, with an audience in mind. It really was uh, designed as a piece for the ages um, and, uh, and possibly with a kind of a, a sublime indifference to whether it would ever actually be performed. Yeah, it's beautiful. But I think he doesn't do any favor to all the composers, you know, who came after him, who then tried to write variations. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a bit tricky to have this sort of as the almost like the beginning point in the Baroque era, and then Beethoven has to try to write his Diabellis, but they seem to me personally, and people will shoot me for this, but they seem so clumsy <laughs> to me in comparison. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's sort of a flawed piece in many ways, beautiful as it is and fascinating, yeah. but it's... It is, it's hard to go to the Diabellis once you spend a lot of time with the Goldbergs. And you could say the same about almost any variations, you know, subsequent variations that came from composers. Um, I, I, I sent the recording of the Goldbergs to John Adams, who's now writing me, a, mm -hmm. he's writing me a piano concerto. So we are, Fantastic. well, we're always in a lot of touch and, 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 you know, unusually these days quite a lot. And, and John just said to me, oh. How many times are you playing this? And I told him 88 times throughout, you know, the whole world or 94. And he said, oh, I just wish Bach was alive to get some of the royalties. <laughs> I thought it was a wonderful point because he certainly didn't get any royalties during his time. And now he has, well, you know, now I, I, it would be interesting to know the Spotify and Apple Music and all those streaming services, you know, the amount of streams and the presence of Bach in today's society, you know, through, through, through headphones. <laughs> Uh, but I, yeah, one can only imagine and, and sort of lament the facts like John does <laughs> for his fellow right. composer. 
Well, you know, the Record Industry Association of America and Spotify should get together and erect a monument to him for uh, helping contribute so much to to the recording industry. But, you know, it's also true that uh, near the very, very end of his life, when he composed the musical offering, Frederick the Great supposedly sent him a box of coins. So, uh, so he could get some recognition. Yeah, a box of coins. That's the least he could have done, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, you know, it is it's it is interesting. 88 times performing the same work. Uh, you know, you can tell me, do you hate it yet just a little? No, I love it more no? than ever before. It's crazy. I mean, and I'm not I'm not just saying that. I, I mean right. that. Um, I played it. I'm in Philadelphia right now, so I played it last night in the Kimball Center. Um Two nights before that in Montreal, and before that I was in Quebec City. Before that, two nights I was in Germany. It just sort of goes on, and, and in each of those four performances, those were the first four performances of 2024 for me. Each of them, I absolutely felt sort of renewed love for the piece, and I played these variations to me extremely differently on all four nights. And I've gone through enough sort of cycles with them now that um, for every variation, you know, the I think the honest performer has to admit that there are, you know, an infinite variety of ways possible when it comes to tempos, dynamic inflections on the modern piano, voicing what you bring out and the polyphony and the counterpoint, um, and how you proportion one variation with the tempo of the next one. I mean, you can create all sorts of smaller units that can work in a very interesting structural way with the Goldberg variations. You can easily see right. variation 16 through a uh, 20 as one unit that you then, you know, find a way of narrating as such, you know, with tempos, with, with everything else at your disposal on the, on the piano. Um, so in that sense, I feel it to be, you know, new every time, honestly, and I do, but there's something also about, you know, the nature of going through the Goldberg variations where you have, you know, 30 beginnings and 30 conclusions in the span of 77 right. minutes or even more if you add the arias you know the beginning and the end um you're always going through birth and closure again and again and again it starts to feel almost like buddhism or something you start to feel you, you sort of go through you go through this this, this and, and 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 it starts to have a, almost a meditative effect on your whole being right right and your decision to do all the repeats and i think your attitude towards ornamentation in this work, I think that I don't remember from the recording many at all. Um, uh, but in some of your other Bach performances, you're you're you know quite readily uh, open to to ornamenting, which is you know certainly was an accepted Baroque practice. What went into those kinds of decisions, and how do you make the repeats um, sort of not just a repeat? In other words, not just the same thing over again. Uh, you know, it's not a carbon copy of, of the first time through. Well, again, it's the it's the layers of dynamics, the the voices. It's almost like you know when you play the Goldberg variations, you can feel almost like a like a, when as if you are holding you know puppets, like you have a puppet theater. What what is it called? I mean, and 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 then you are sort of sort of directing the Goldberg variations almost uh, as if you would be a director. You know, you have all the different voices of the Goldberg variations, and they. You know, some of them take center stage and the other ones, you know, become supporting roles. But each and every one, like in good theater, has basically equal importance. It all has to come together into into this three-dimensionality of the stage. And that's how you can easily feel in Goldberg variations. And then the repeats, um, you have so many options for the dialogue between the voices to become very organic and very sort of biological. Um, so it's a, it's a constantly changing... Uh, web of, of 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 lines that that you don't have to work too hard. I mean, it's it would be more difficult to repeat each variation exactly the way you played it before. I think uh, that would be more of a challenge, to be honest with you, because it sort of works against the fundamental nature of the Goldberg variations. Um, but yeah, I mean, with ornaments and recordings, it's a good question. I have I have a few ornaments in there, of course, uh, but at the same time, when you listen on repeat or you revisit an album again and again and again and again, an album with this many repeats, the ornament can almost become an overemphasized difference in the repeat to my ears. Um, so I prefer to do it sometimes with texture and with probably slightly more subtle uh, 
a produce uh, than just putting a big, thick <laughs> sort of a sort of spin on the melody that you then have to hear always the same on every repeat. I, I feel it's almost it's almost too much. It, it's it's almost too slightly clumsy, you know, in that format. But in my live performances, I actually perhaps play more with uh, those kinds of uh, ornaments uh, in the in the moment than I do on mm -hmm. the recording. Right. Well, you know, I think the in Baroque music, the ornament sometimes is intended to be kind of a a bit of a surprise, you know, tossed off spontaneously and, and usually as, a, as an expression of the facility of the performer to show that, you know, you can do it. And, and if you become too familiar with an ornament on a record because it's, you know, you listen to it 5, 10, 15 times and you know it's coming, then that sense of surprise and spontaneity can't really exist anymore. Yeah, it's true. And it's also just a matter of the sort of sound world of the modern piano, which is so rich and sort of full and flexible. Uh, so if you compare it with the sound world of the harpsichord, it's a completely different beast. Um, and, and you know, the, the role of the ornament to me in that sound world of the harpsichord is very different from the role on, in the, on the piano world. And certainly in, in the organ world, you know, as the third one, you know, I certainly think organists tend to do a lot less ornamentation in general, with exceptions, than, than, than let's say, harpsichordists. Just because the sound world of the organ seems to ask for different things and you have other means at your disposal. Um, so Right. Yeah, for sure. Let's let's talk a little bit about your musical beginnings and how they, they influence you to today. Um, you grew up in a place that's separated from the musical mainstream, you know, a nation that has the, whose entire population is that of a small city, you know, for uh, people who aren't as familiar with Iceland. I think the population is a little under 400,000 right now, uh, which means that, you know, for those in my neighborhood, uh, that means uh, about 100,000 less than the city of Hamilton, Ontario, <laughs> uh, which is down the road from Toronto. Um, so that's... Uh, an opportunity in a sense to develop an individual voice, I think, because you're not, you know, in a cosmopolitan environment and you're also surrounded by, by nature. Um, and you know, nature that is stark and austere nature that'll kill you very quickly if you're not careful, uh, which perhaps gives you a, a sense of the, the fragility of life and perhaps a special, you know, appreciation for it. The grandeur of nature can kind of have an ecstatic quality. If we read our Schopenhauer, you know, it kind of, you know, takes away the ego when you are confronted with how small you are compared to it. I mean, how are these things that, that kind of are in the marrow of your bones uh, as you approach musical works? Yeah, the way you describe Iceland, uh, it's very beautiful. And I think it is maybe Iceland of the past as well, because I think today with sort of the connectivity and the globalization of everything in the 21st century, the idea of a place as such is quickly vanishing, you know, or it's changing, uh, everything, you know, Iceland in the nineties, when I was really growing up, sort of Iceland before the internet almost, um, was a very different place from Iceland of today. And so I think, you know, I'm born in 1984, so one of the last sort of the last generation to really remember the world before the internet took over and changed everything. I think my sons for two and four will have a very different feeling for Iceland and, and being an Icelander than, than, than I perhaps did growing up. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it has to affect you and it's hard to, to analyze it too much yourself. It's almost like trying to analyze how did your mother influence you, you know, or your parents, you know, of course, sort of beyond words, uh, it, it becomes a part of who you are. And I think the same for someone like, well, we're on the, you know, Gould standard for Glenn Gould, you know, the idea of coming from Canada was also, you know, a complete outsider. He wasn't born in Moscow and, and he wasn't in, you know, he wasn't trained at, you know, in, in New York or, or in Paris conservatoire with Alfred Cocteau or something, you know, uh, he was an outsider in that sense. Uh, so, so. So yeah, I, I think it's it can be quite wonderful, but it has its challenges to come from a place like Iceland. Uh, we don't have that tradition. We don't have, um, I mean, I am 
kind of the first pianist ever to have a global career or almost instrumentalist on as a soloist uh, coming from that island. It's strange to say that in the year 2024, but I guess that holds true more or less. Um, and so, so you have to sort of ask your own questions. There is, there is no Icelandic piano school and, and, uh, and, 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 and the whole upbringing, the musical upbringing was sort of much freer than I'd say most of my colleagues had. And I remember when I, when I got to New York, when I was 18 to study at Juilliard and I chose New York very much because I wanted the absolute contrast to Iceland. I wanted the, well, I wanted my teacher, Gerald Lowenthal, but I also wanted uh, the Metropolitan Opera and the New York Philharmonic and Carnegie Hall and everything that I didn't have because we had almost no concerts in Iceland. But I mean, I remember coming there and, and meeting all my classmates who were then 18 and had grown up in Beijing and in Moscow and in London and in New York, and they're coming from usually these metropoles. And, and um, sort of they had practiced so much and they had had so much pressure to work from their parents or from the system that they grew up in, that some of them at least, uh, you know, used the opportunity once they got away from all of that and, and had the kind of independence to, to actually buy a PlayStation and start to, you know, have their first sip of beer or whatever and do all the things you're not supposed to do and all the things that I did when I was, you know, 14, 15 <laughs> and 16 <laughs> in, in, in slightly wild Iceland, you know, um, uh, you know, make some of the mistakes that one has to make at some point. But when I was 18, for instance, I, I had, no one had ever told me to practice. That was something that, that came from within. And before I was 12, quite frankly, I didn't practice very much. I was just very good on the piano and I was the most talented kid back home, of course. Uh, but, but, but I think that, that kind of freedom and slightly wild approach, uh, had, you know, created some challenges for me, you know, I had to catch up on certain things, uh, but it also had built this foundation within me that, that music is there to be enjoyed and loved and then sort of from that attitude and, and from that source, um. I would only play the piano when I wanted to play the piano, which happened to be quite a lot. Uh, but, you know, I, I think as opposed to, you know, being locked in a room from nine to 12, and now you have to practice your three hours on a Saturday morning before you're allowed to do anything else, uh, attitude, uh, that I certainly never had. Um, but I think that is the biggest sort of difference. And maybe also the fact that Iceland, well, like I said, doesn't have a great pianist in the background looming there. So, so I was sort of free to to choose my idols from very contrasting in different directions, which included Glenn Gould, but also Alfred Korto and Benno Moisevich from the complete opposite directions, like Rachmaninoff, but also, you know, uh, Dino Lipati and Clara Haskell and uh, Myra right. Hess and the classicists. And it's sort of all, it was all kind of a, a huge melting pot of influences that, that came to my, you know, 12, 13 and 14 year old mind as I really started to, to listen to music. And like I said, I didn't have the access to live performances because we hardly had any great performers come to Iceland in those years. Um, I had to rely very much on my parents' record collection, which was slightly different from, from most, you know, kids growing up in bigger cities who can actually attend the symphony orchestra. I, I, my love for recording is perhaps comes from that a little bit that, that I really had to rely on, on the LPs and, and the CDs of my parents' collection in order to get to know the music that I love so much. The then moment the day my father trusted me with his record player, you know, because they were always afraid I would ruin the needle on the, on the vinyl player. But the moment when I was like 12 or 13, he finally taught me how to do it and allowed me to do it and trusted me with it. It was like the greatest moment of my life because all of a sudden I had like, you know, meters in their, in their shelves with LPs that I had just been dreaming of listening to. Uh, that is uh, fantastic. And actually, it uh, so many different thoughts strike me from that. Um, but first, I, I did want to talk about, you know, some of the, the areas, and you, you've touched on it as well, parallels between you and Gould. Again, I don't like to, to overstress those because you really are a very, very different artist. Just take your attitudes towards Mozart uh, as, a, as a for instance. Uh, but... Um, you grew up in places that were not in the mainstream that in which you know the um the ruggedness of nature was a very big you know factor in a world view um both i would say you know have a very 
powerful and profound sense of inwardness in your playing. I think it's one of the things that really draws people to you is that sense of intense concentration where essentially when you listen, the the world around you seems to disappear and you're in a purely musical uh, world. And I think that's one of the, the, the keys to Gould's enduring appeal as well. The concept of ecstasy, of ecstasis, um, you know, of standing outside of yourself, be, you know, what I guess evangelical Christians call being slain in the spirit. Um, you know, those are all attributes that you have in common. And also the, um, and I think it comes from, you know, an experience of solitude and also being outside of the, the mainstream, the, the courage or the, let's say, single-mindedness to what Gould called walk against the zeitgeist, you know, mm. how he could, you know, have the nerve to begin his recording career with a major label playing a piece that really had only had two other significant recordings before, neither of which had sold very well, you know, the Goldbergs, uh, or at a time when, you know, the entire musical world was very down on Richard Strauss for him to champion him as, you know, sort of along with Schoenberg, the composer of the of the 20th century. You know, those kinds of of things that um, that really sort of don't reflect the, you know, what everyone else is doing and what everyone else thinks. Um, so do, do those descriptions resonate with you? Yeah, I, I've done a program with uh, Strauss and Bach myself, you see. <laughs> I mean, anachronistic composers, people who have, you know, their own ways and go against the tides of their time, it's always an interesting thing, you know, individualism. Gould is, of course, the most individualistic classical pianist in, in history, and I think he will remain in that role and, in, you know, in that position uh, for centuries to come. I don't think it's going to be surpassed. The one advice I think one can give to younger musicians is to know what you want to do before the music industry tells you what you should become. And I remember reading somewhere or hearing an interview with Gould where he's talking about how he had to convince, you know, Columbia Records to allow him to record the Goldberg Variations because certainly that was an odd choice. Uh, and he only had to convince them once and after that they allowed him to do whatever the hell he wanted to do, which is wonderful. I mean. I had the same experience, you know, with Deutsche Grammophon, for instance. Um, I had to, when I released my first record, which was Philip Glass, uh, in honor of Philip on his 80th birthday, which was a very offbeat way to enter the Deutsche Grammophon <laughs> catalog. Um, you know, I was absolutely sad that my second album would be Johann Sebastian Bach. And I thought I had earned that with the kind of success of the Philip Glass album. But, you know, at that point, uh, uh, there were marketing meetings and all these meetings where people said, no, because of the success of the Philip Glass album, we've come to realize that you have something very special when it comes to American music. So we're going to make you record now uh, another <laughs> album that has to be American. Um, it can be Philip Glass, or maybe you can do John Adams, or maybe you do Terry Riley, or you know, maybe we do Steve Rack's Six Pianos, where you play six times and tap yourself, whatever. I mean, it, it, it was that kind of discussion where kind of the success of, of the debut was actually being used almost against you uh, to govern yes. your path going forward. And I realized this was a sort of pivotal moment for me in my little path uh, that I had to sort of stick up, you know, and stand up for my ideals and actually threaten to leave uh, and, and break up the contract if I wouldn't be allowed to do my Bach album because... I thought if I would do another Philip Glass album or something like that, I would send the wrong signal to the world that was just getting to know me. I was right. relatively unknown before. Um, and so they, f they finally agreed. Uh, and the Bach album became, I mean, so much more successful than Philip Glass. And we very often underrate, you know, old music when it comes to popularity. We think that, you know, something like minimalism is going to sell or track loads right. of albums or something like right, that. And right. Philip Glass has to be the key to success because, you know, in the ATC seemed to connect the world of pop and classical or whatever. Um, but, but, you know, but that moment comes for so many artists one way or another, you know, so let's say a great orchestra contacts you and gives you a debut that you have been dreaming of having for years, but the orchestra says, oh, but the repertoire has to be Rhapsody in Blue and you happen to hate Rhapsody in Blue for whatever reason. <laughs> what are you going to say to the Chicago Symphony or the Berlin Cinema, whatever the orchestra is? What are you going to say? You're going to say no, of course. Yeah. But, 
but that is difficult to do and that is you know the crucial thing to do that's i think what perhaps school example has taught me and so many of us uh, that you have to know how to say no and uh, right. and and you have you have to be at least two steps ahead of both the record labels and the promoters you always have to sort of tell them who you are and not wait for them to explain to you who you will become yeah well as as a former a and r man with my own <laughs> record label myself i absolutely say touche because <laughs> i i really tried in my own life to to avoid that i i would go to artists who had had successes with us and say okay what are you going to do next that's going to completely surprise everybody yeah. because you know the idea of you know I, well one of our our winners of the glenn gould prize jesse norman once famously said uh when they talked about how you, they, no one could categorize her voice you know mezzo you know dramatic soprano why are you singing mozart then you know that sort of thing and she said pigeon holes are for pigeons uh, so I think that was, uh, that was put it very succinctly, but it also, I think, you know, another reflection of, of that independence of spirit is how you have never been interested in competitions, uh, which is another thing you had in common with Gould. He despised competitions. He said that it was competition, not money. That was the root of all evil. It's very interesting. I mean, I went to Juilliard and I did two competitions at school and I won one of them and I lost the other. And coming back to, well, you mentioned Schopenhauer earlier, you know, the, the pleasure of, you know, derived from the animal that is, you know, eating the other animal, the, you know, the equivalent's pain is, the, the pain is much stronger than the pleasure. And so losing was so much more painful than, than winning. Uh, and I hated it so much. I mean, as soon as I got the, the, as soon as I won, I took it for granted. So it, it it was great for a night, and then the next morning it had left me. Uh, whereas the the feeling of loss and and and, and the rejection from the jury uh, stayed with me for for some months. Uh, and and I just thought, well, it's not competitions. It's not healthy to win, and it's not healthy to lose either. <laughs> Both of them are unhealthy, actually. Um, right. uh, and and so if if there is a way uh, for me to to get away you know, from them and not have to do any of them, um, that's going to be my path. It's also because in Iceland, we had no competitions. I mean, we had one and I, I, I won that one, but it wasn't the serious competition. It was nothing, you know, right. in the year 2000, it was my only encounter with this. Um, and you know, once you go through juries at university college, when you're playing and you see five faculty members of whatever institution you are studying at, and they sit there sometimes quite bored because they've just had, you know, four days of the same and all these students playing the Chopin etudes and the late Beethoven sonatas and whatever. Um, it's, it's very hard when you start to play to forget about them and sort of your mind is somehow in the music, but sort of sadly, it's also a little bit on their desk. And yes. that, that is for me, I could never really get away from that when I was in that situation at Juilliard, for instance, you're doing my juries or doing these two competitions I did. I, I was a little bit, I could never escape the jury. The jury was always with me in the music making and, and it wasn't having a positive effect on me. And right. I also just think that great art isn't really created in committee. You know, <laughs> yes. I don't, I, I don't, I don't really believe in that. You know, I, I, I mean, I love the fact that people give prizes and they want to reward and they, and they, I, I love the fact that you have all these competitions and people are trying to lift young talents. Um, but there are also a few things that it's, it's very easy to object to. The fact that once you win a major prize, and many of my friends did, uh, you know, from college, uh, you become an ambassador of that brand. You know, you become the winner of that competition and you're booked as such into the slots in the season of this and that promoter. And, and then you are presented as the winner of the blah, blah, blah competition. And that, and that's right. very difficult to then, when you have a new winner three years later, it's very difficult to then sort of, uh, modulate yourself into being, you know, the king girl or the artist, as opposed to the winner of the competition. And if you don't win, you know, if you spend six or seven years trying to win these competitions, um, chances are you are spending the most important years of your life, the years when you perhaps are no longer studying with an authority, a teacher, a master, and you are basically recreating, you know, what you have been taught by that teacher. You're usually playing the same concertos, a romantic, maybe a Rachmaninoff three, and maybe you're 
classical concerto is always going to be Beethoven fifth or something like that. And that's what you yep. bring. You always do the Schumann quintet, or maybe you chose the Brahms, but you stick with that one that you've done at Juilliard. And then you do your, you know, the Prelude and Fugue that you know how to do and the Chopin Etude Opus 25 number, you know, six, because you know how to do that really well. Uh, whatever. I mean, you, know, you, yeah. you, you, you the, get the little party piece, stuck. right? You get a little bit stuck in the repertoire. Yeah. And, yep. and, um, and that, that is, uh, I think the tragedy, because what, what you should be doing in those years is to get away from your teachers and get away from all the things that you've been taught and, you know, that you've sort of accepted as, as wisdom from above and you have to become your own teacher. And look at the Goldberg Variations with Glenn Gould. It's the first piece that he said that he studied by himself. Um, and that, uh, that, uh, I mean, that, that is miraculous that he then re recorded it like that in 1955. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable thing. Uh, but he did, and, and, and it shows sort of the importance of, of that, of that modulation or transition, um, where you become your own teacher gradually, and you're not going to be perfect at first, and it's going to take you 10 years or something like that before you really know how to listen to yourself. And there's no better way to become your own teacher than to, to record and to actually listen to yourself from a distance, from a perspective. And so if I had my way in an ideal world, uh, I'd use all the money that these competitions are, are sort of, you know, channeling into the system, paying the juries, paying the fees and doing all the marketing. I mean, all the prices, I would take all that money and I would just create this huge fund that young artists who have just finished their school could just apply for, and then they could get studio lessons so they could release music and think about that as the way forward and, and, and get, get known through that. And the only conditions I would have would be that they would release music that they haven't studied with a teacher, but they would actually be learning from scratch by themselves. That right. That's how I did it. That's how I uh, sort of, I think, got stronger as a musician. I mean, in every way, you know, also, also technically, you know, and, I, and, 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 and uh, structurally for sure. Right. And I think that competitions tend to work against individuality. Because if you have, let's say, a jury of six, you know, pianists and pedagogues, and it's often a combination of people who have performing careers and ones who are largely pedagogical in their careers, and they come from different perspectives, different traditions, uh, they're going to have disagreements about anyone whose approach is markedly different. It's going to be appealing to one, offensive to another. So they go uh, and settle on someone who's interpretively more or less down the middle, but has technical perfection. Actually, um, but we have to we have to say there are examples where this doesn't happen, like when Daniel Krifonov took the prizes in all these competitions in one year. And there are some very individualistic, incredible people who do also come through sometimes. So not not not, not to generalize all competitions and such, but this tends to happen. And great great art does not unite people. It actually <laughs> does quite the opposite. Great art actually splits opinion. And, and, and when, I, when I first met Alfred Brendel, I was actually in Busoni Festival to perform in 2012. And do you know what I was performing? Long before I became known on the international scene, I was play, playing an homage to Glenn Gould recital, uh, where I did a program where I actually, because Gould was a very important uh, influence on me and almost like a teacher in my years after Juilliard, where I was trying to become my own teacher anyway. So the director of the Busoni Festival had heard my very early Bach recording with Partitas 2 and 5 and Chopin Preludes. Um, and, you know, he thought this guy should do this. I, he wanted to celebrate Gould for his, what would have been his 80th birthday in, in 2012. And so, so I was there to play this All Master Gould uh, concert. And Alfred Brendel was also in the festival and uh, we had coffee. And Brendel was extremely nice to me and the most wonderful man, a contemporary, I mean, born, I think, the year before or the same year as, as Gould, basically the same, very much the same generation. And I hope Alfred will forgive me for, for saying this, but the first thing he said to me, uh, knowing that I was about to play the Amash Gould program, he said, how can you tolerate Glenn Gould? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry, Alfred, but for sharing this, but it's beautiful. No, 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 but that's because, fine because, because it's such a, like, that, that, that says so much, you know, and, and, yes. and, 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 and it's, 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 they're so different and, and, and that's how Gould probably would never have won uh, any of the major competitions yet been like the most important pianist of the 20th century or one of the top five, you know. The Glenn Gould Foundation is a registered Canadian charity and we rely on the support of arts lovers like you to keep bringing inspiring stories to life. Please consider giving by visiting our website, glengould.ca 
and follow us across social media at the Glenn Gould Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Gould Standard. Thank you.